Hello everyone and welcome um, to my presentation Facing the Challenges of Updating Complex Systems with the subtitle Putting it All Together. Well, short about me, um, my name is Enrico Jörns. I'm an embedded software engineer working at Pengotronics. Um, we are uh, basically an embedded Linux consultant company and I am the co-maintainer of the RAUC updating framework. So I'm from the topic a bit close to updating. And this is what the uh, talk today will be about. So a bit on the background, on the motivation. So in the past years, we've seen uh, a growing zoo of um, embedded update tools like uh, SW Update, Mender, uh, RAUC, Arise. And uh, so you could think that um, updating embedded system is, well, a soft topic. But if you take a closer look uh, at your system, well, there are uh, many different uh, aspects, many different components in your system um, that not only uh, live together separately, but that are connected together. You have uh, your init system that has to start your application. You have a, maybe a watch, watchdog. You have to care for your data during updating, um, handle in the bootloader. Then you have a deployment server uh, where your update comes from. And in the end, you also want to test this entire change. And there are a lot of uh, building blocks uh, that, um, yeah, that cannot be covered by such an uh, update framework and that are very custom to uh, your hardware, to your use case, and to what your application needs. And, well, um, when we deal with updates, the bootloader is a very critical point because in most systems, the bootloader is a single point of failure. And now, uh, when you want to start with U-boot or Grub or something like this, then uh, implementing a redundant system often means that you have to uh, write a script for the bootloader that uh, takes some variables and do, does a selection of the uh, proper boot targets. So this is exactly what we just remove in the user space with those update frameworks. So why don't we uh, use those frameworks in the bootloader too? And here's one example of an already existing framework from the Babux bootloader. It's called the boot chooser framework. Well, here's a short overview um, about uh, the structural view. So it has a basic algorithm that uh, does the actual boot selection, some configuration to adapt it to your system's needs, and uh, a persistent status where it uh, stores information about uh, the current status of the boot targets. And if we take a deeper look in it, the basic simplified algorithm looks like this. We have for each boot target uh, two variables that we maintain, a priority, and a remaining attempts counter. And if we start our system, um, we power it on, and then first of all check if the re remaining attempts counter for the individual boot target is larger than zero. If then, then we choose the boot target with the highest priority, decrease the remaining attempts counter, and then boot. And if the booting fails, uh, either because uh, we can't uh, load the the kernel image or because we hit a watchdog reset during starting, then it uh, ends again in this uh, bootloader and does it again and again. And during this, the attempts counter decreases. And if the attempts counter for one of these boot targets reaches zero, then we switch to the other one. And uh, the normal case would be we decrease the attempts counter then boot to our running system, and if we are sure that we've booted successfully, then we reset the remaining attempts counter to its default value. So uh, this is basically what the framework provides with some configuration, like, for example, if you power on the system, we want the re remaining attempts counter for all targets to be reset to their default values so that we uh, can recover our targets by switching the power off or on. Well, uh, another example where we don't have to implement the switching uh, itself is on x86. So in, on x86, you uh, have UEFI normally, and there you can or have the uh, boot entries for each target you want to boot. And with the boot entries, 
it is uh, possible to load a kernel fully without an additional bootloader, just by uh, referencing the kernel we want to boot and uh, giving a rootfs argument that references the root file system to boot. And uh, then we are able, by setting the uh, UEFI boot order variable, to atomically switch the order of the targets to boot. And also, we have the boot next counter, which uh, is some sort of uh, temporary setting uh, it to our boot target for trying to boot. And if it fails to boot, then it's not persisted. And the next time the target reboots, we have the original order back. So uh, there's no inner drama fest required, no bootloader, just uh, kernel and rootfs boot. So this is an other option for that. Well, when updating the bootloader, it's often is a single point of failure. You don't have redundant one, but um, depending on the hardware that you're users, uh, there are some exceptions. One example I have here is if you use an eMMC, this one has a dedicated or two dedicated boot partitions. So boot zero and boot one. And if we take this example, we boot it uh, with our bootloader from boot one, start a system, and if we now want to update the bootloader, we simply write it to the boot zero partition, not having switched anything in the XCSD, which is responsible uh, for telling the ROM code which boot partition to load. And then at the very end step, when we are sure we've updated the, the bootloader successfully, then we do the atomic switch and uh, have uh, a running updated bootloader in an atomic way. So uh, another common issue when starting our updated system is something goes wrong and the system uh, hangs, maybe in the kernel or uh, during execution of our application. So uh, a common way to solve that is using watchdogs, of course. And uh, a watchdog is normally triggered during booting. So we start during booting. And then the kernel and uh, the init system, they have to trigger the watchdog in regular intervals. So uh, that is counted does not remain zero. It does not uh, count down to zero. If that happens in this uh, case shown there when uh, the system hangs, then the uh, watchdog counter expires and the watchdog uh, pulls the reset of the board and reboots the board so that we don't end up in an, uh, in an unbehaving system. Well, um, as for the basic system, also our applications might hang and uh, we want to be able to detect that and want to be able to recover from that and um, a nice uh, tool for that is this systemd uh, watchdog, uh, systemd init system that provides the watchdog uh, multiplexer interface. So systemd itself uh, triggers the hardware watchdog so that you can be sure that systemd is running and also for uh, rebooting your device it sets a watchdog so that if you get stuck during reboot and then it uh, provides a software watchdog for the individual applications that you run. And uh, for each application, you can uh, configure a proper interval, and then your application has to uh, notify a system D in that interval to not get reset. And uh, if it's not notified, then you can select a system what you want to do with it. Uh, what, do you want to restart it or uh, skip or also, reboot the entire system depends on how critical the application that uh, just crashed is. And in general, systemd uh, using an um, embedded system that you want to update in a robust way is a good idea because it's a very central point and it has a very central view of the uh, entire system and all the components running on the system. And it provides uh, fine-grained control about behavior when an application or a service um, fails. So if you want to restart it, when you want to restart it with which intervals between multiple tries and when you want to uh, abort trying to restart a service and reboot the entire system and so on. It has a watchdog multiplex I already described. And for example, the uh, system update uh, method that is uh, a way for um, bootstrapping 
the bootstrapping configuration data uh, on the initial boot of a system by uh, just uh, placing a system update uh, file in the root file system, then system boots into a special target, performs some actions, and then uh, reboots, and so you can bootstrap uh, initial data on your system, for example. Well, what you also have to care about when uh, thinking about uh, developing your system is how you store and where you store your data and how and where you migrate your data. So a simple example is that you store your uh, data in the root file system if you have a read-writable file system and then your update tool has to care for it to first write uh, the image to the secondary root partition and after that copy all the data that you need on the second uh, partition to it from the currently running one. So it's uh, good if you fall back, you uh, still have um, data that is accessible by the old system, but it may be outdated. Well, of course. And another approach is that you have a single data partition that is uh, mounted in the root file system. There, uh, no copying is required because uh, both the current and the uh, updated system will use the same data. Uh, migration is also possible, but if you fall back and migrated data before, that might be tricky because the old uh, application might not be able to uh, read the data you just, uh, up, you just migrated with the new application. So uh, there's a third approach if you have redundant root file systems to also use redundant data file systems. And again, the copying of the uh, data can be done by the bootloader, the migration should be done by the application because this has a best view of what data it requires. Um, mounting is a bit more tricky because you have to find out um, in the system which of the data partition belong to your actual root file system and not mix it up. And yeah, falling back uh, is again more simple but uh, again depending on your use case you, always, uh, you also access all data so you um, have to make clear if this is a valid use case for your application to access all data or if you uh, want to uh, not allow fallbacks in general. Um, also a topic is uh, I'm uh, frequently asked about how uh, updating performs with uh, verified or trusted boot. Uh, just a short note about this because uh, in many cases this is uh, orthogonal to the updating Taking DM Verity here as an example is uh, that in this case you uh, create your root file system image and uh, the hash tree, the Merkle hash tree for the root file system on your build system and for the update system itself it's uh, just like writing data to your block device so it's transparent to it. Um, if you're using DM Integrity uh, then you've uh, got the handling in your currently in your running system uh, covered and uh, then you can use uh, for example a char extraction to update your system then uh, also the running system will uh, handle all the uh, mapping itself because it's like simple extracting a char to an X4 file system and uh, the DM integrity layer below handles uh, the journaling and the text creation and so on. Well. As I already said, um, it is important for an update uh, that you tested your update for robust updating. And it's not like only testing software, uh, it's like testing the entire updating chain. So um, from the, from the uh, start of the system to the updating cycle to the reboot to the newly running system. And uh, this is quite tricky because uh, you have to interact with the hardware and the good framework for this that provides uh, this functionality is uh, LabGrid. It's um, based on uh, PyTest and you can, it has an abstraction and way of uh, interacting with uh, shells over serial lines. So a shell driver that knows how to uh, deal with a Linux shell, a uh, Bearbox driver that knows how to uh, communicate with Bearbox, uh, how to type something in the shell, a shell um, get variable names and so on, and a power drive that allows you to power the system and then a simple test case for your uh, device could be you provide test that provides a target, triggers up to it to, to install it, 
power cycle it and uh, then test in the bootloader, okay, did it select the other root file system partition and test in the uh, Linux, okay, uh, am I running the right root file system, the new application, is every service up and running and so on. Well, um, normally when we want to perform updates over the network, so remote updates, we have uh, two major issues that we uh, often come across. This is uh, that our updates are too large. We often have uh, devices that only have constrained connection and so an update takes very long and uh, wastes a lot of data. And uh, we also require a temporary storage for the uh, update image we download, where we can download it to the target and temporarily store it before actually installing it. And so what you want to uh, come across it is uh, Delta updates. And uh, yeah, in, this is an example taken uh, from the RAUC uh, update framework. And uh, we wanted to have Delta updates, network functionality, and we didn't want to, rent to reinvent the wheel. And then suddenly the async plot up. And according to Wikipedia, the async is a Linux software utility designed to distribute frequently update file system images over the internet. Sounds like something we could use. So let's have a look uh, what it actually does. Um, the async uh, is a chunking uh, algorithm basically. So you take your block device either or a full directory tree and the async creates a serialized stream of this and then splits the stream into small uh, chunks in a reproducible way and uh, in a way that you can later on uh, compare chunks to similar, uh, to similar images uh, in a good way. So then it takes a uh, creates uh, hashes of the uh, different um, chunks and stores them sequently in an index file and uh, all the chunk data itself it compresses and uh, stores under the name of the hash in a chunk store. And now we can uh, reverse it and extract it. Then if we extract a CA sync index file to either a block device or a directory tree, then CA sync scans through the uh, index file and uh, looks in the chunk store for each of the chunks, uh, fetches it over network and directly uh, deserializes it and writes it to the device. So there's no temporary storage required, we have uh, remote access because uh, the async brings all the remote uh, functionality required uh, to work over HTTPS, HTTP, SFTP and so on. And uh, yeah, we can uh, write it sequentially to the device. So now how do we use it in RAUC currently? Well, um, what we do is we want to update running from slot A to slot B. And uh, so we uh, perform the same chunking algorithm we performed on the image we want uh, to use for updating on the slot and store the uh, information about where to find the data for each chunk in a so-called seed store on our target. And then when installing uh, an update, which is uh, basically an index file of the async here, and uh, we scan through all these uh, different elements. Then we first take a look at our seed store, if we can fetch the data from local. And if it's there, we get the data from our slot A and write it to slot B. And only for these chunks that differ from the uh, currently one, uh, for this we have to um, make a remote access and uh, call, call this small chunk from the chunk store server. So this is basically how it works. And another topic that uh, you care about when having a lot of devices is uh, field deployment. Well, if you uh, have your update and uh, deploy it to a large uh, field of devices, and uh, yeah, there is a bug that you uh, didn't discover during uh, testing or something like this in the update, then uh, you've updated all your system and might say, oh, damn, I uh, bricked almost half of them. So uh, it's a good uh, way to have a good deployment strategy for this. And for this also a uh, good open source tool exists called Hawkbit, 
Well, Hotbit is uh, basically a deployment server, um, provides a web uh, interface, a web UI for the user where you can manually uh, configure updates or, and configure complete rollouts we'll see later on, and a management API that allows to do this automatically. Uh, so, uh, yeah, by some other backends or something like this. And on the other side, it has a device integration API. This is where the uh, devices register to Hawkbit and verify and pull of, uh, in a uh, fixed interval to check if there are new updates for them available. And if we take a scenario then, um, Hawkbit supports uh, deployment strategies. Uh, like I could uh, switch, I could um, split up the entire group of, um, um, of targets here into three groups and say, okay, I set an error threshold at 50%, which means if uh, at least 50% of the devices uh, come back alive, okay, then I continue updating. And what Hawkbit then does is uh, it uh, starts with the first group, updates, and then after having updated successfully, the uh, targets reports are started back. And okay, we see uh, more than half of the targets came back successfully. So Hotbit will uh, start to uh, schedule the next group of updates. And in this group of updates, uh, we see, oh, it's uh, below us, it's above our threshold. So two devices uh, failed. So uh, we say, oh, stop, something went wrong. We stop our update and we will not uh, kill the other targets uh, with a broken update. So, um, yeah, what we've seen, um, we have uh, these update frameworks, they uh, solve uh, much uh, challenges we had in the past, but they don't uh, solve all challenges. You still uh, have to know what your system requires, how your application behaves, which parts of the system you want to monitor, have running on the system, and uh, how to properly configure a watchdog and rebooting of your devices, how to interact with your hardware and so on. So uh, this is only, yeah, it's not just uh, stacking different components uh, like an update tool and a deployment server, the async and so on, but you have to uh, well configure all these components so that they can work together and give you a robust, a fully robust update system. So come to the end. Are there any questions? I think we have a few minutes left. Otherwise, if you want to uh, discuss uh, a bit more tomorrow at um, half past 1 p.m., uh, I'll be at the Open Embedded uh, stand. There is a small updating demo uh, that uh, shows Rauk in interaction with Hawkpit. So uh, if you like to come and see all the time and if you want to be sure that you can discuss with us, just uh, visit us tomorrow at 1.30 p.m. Yes? Uh, well, it depends on the uh, actual, uh, on how you uh, build a system, if your system is secure or what do you mean about uh, a secure system? If you want to be uh, sure, uh, so uh, the question was if uh, someone could uh, change something in the system and uh, does it. Well, the updating itself is, uh, if you use RAUC and most other tools too, is verified. So um, only those uh, who have the right key are for uh, signing the image uh, will be able to create images that will be accepted by RAUC. This is the part of the update system. Then. On the target, you uh, can uh, prevent somebody from accessing it by uh, yeah, using trusted boot and all these mechanisms uh, that it just uh, briefly uh, came across. Or, yeah. Does it answer your question, basically? Okay, great. Yeah. Can you speak up a bit? I don't get it.
So uh, the question was, what's the smallest system uh, it's uh, working on? So um, a bit on dependencies, Rauk uses glib. So it uh, has to be a system uh, that is able to run glib. It has to be a system that is running Linux. Rauk itself is uh, quite small, and it also uh, supports uh, not the full AB setup code, it needs more storage. You can also have a, a recovery or something like this, which uh, needs less storage. So uh, I think glib is about seven megabytes or something like this, and a rauk is a few kilobytes. Okay. Do you still have time? Questions left? So otherwise, thanks for attending my talk. <laughs>